while we're getting uh, while we're waiting for people to come in, I wanted to just um, refresh everybody's memory. Um, if you you know have kind of forgotten everything over the past couple of weeks, um, you know uh, to get started and, and be prepared for the hands-on, which will happen in the the second half of this um, session. Uh, you may want to run back through the Met Plus setup. Um, you know, go ahead and and uh, you know make sure that your environment is set up properly. Um, you know, here's the examples of how to set up on Cheyenne and on Jet, on Hera. Um, if you have your own um, Linux box for either Bash or Seashell, um, and then once you're done with that, go ahead and and you know go through just um, running the tutorial script and making sure that your um, your environment is set up properly. Additionally, if you're working on um, on the uh, cloud on AWS. Just a refresher that the, um, the information that you need is in the Met Plus Training external drive. If you go to the, um, the Google Sheet here. Um, oh, that is wrong. I went to the wrong thing, sorry. If you go to Cloud IP Addresses login, um, you can um, refresh your memory as to what your IP address is and um, you know, how to go ahead and get logged in and, and what to do after that. So, um, hopefully that's enough information um, to get you started. Uh, if you are having trouble um, with getting uh, set back up, um, go ahead and, and put that um, uh, request in chat. And we might. Uh, what we'll do is we'll spin off a, a little um, a, a breakout room uh, so that you can go into a breakout room with someone and um, they can hopefully help you get set back up. So. Um, any quick questions on uh, what you need to do to get set up? Okay. Then with that, uh, we're, let's get going. Because um, as I said, there's a lot of material to cover. Uh, we gave this presentation on the 21st. This is a repeat, um, but if anybody has ever seen me present, you know that I never present the same way twice. So there's, it's very possible that there will be um, slightly different information conveyed here. Um, I also went through the presentation and, um, you know, there were a few um, typos and mistakes, um, you know, uh, in the, the presentation. So I went through and, and cleaned that up as well. So um, if, you've, if you watched the first one, um, it's definitely worthwhile to, to stick around for this one and see if you can pick up some additional information, so. Okay, so we're going to be talking about um, the GridStat tool. I'm going to run through a presentation about it. We're not actually going to run GridStat um, uh, on the command line during the session, um, but instead we're going to jump directly into running it using Met Plus. Um, I'm going to go into some detail on some aspects of GridStat, um, and then um, some of the, the slides in here are just um, included to just give you a sense of what else is available. Some of that we will actually be talking about um, later on in the the session. Um, I did also want to give a, a chance um, to uh, if John Opatz is here. Is he here? John O, do you want to um, quickly introduce the survey and go ahead and, and tell people what we're trying to do and, and uh, put the link in the chat real quick so they can be doing that while they're also listening? Sure can. Uh, this is just a brief survey. Uh, it's only about seven questions. Let me grab the URL and as Tara said, um, we'll post it in the chat. It's also available in the last session's um, drop down uh, agenda as well as this uh, session's agenda. So you should have access to all of the, um, you, anywhere you go really, you'll have access to this uh, survey. And basically, it's focused on um, one trying to assess: um, Are we, uh, you know, hitting the right level of detail um, on our presentations and and our hands-on? And then, secondly, looking forward into like February, March, April, trying to um, to, to determine um, once we get through the very basic core part of Met and Met Plus, um, you know, what do we want to focus on for those um, remaining sessions? So uh, we do encourage you to go ahead and take that survey. Okay, so I'm going to jump in now. Um, so uh, just, to, just to get you grounded back into um, where this all started, the, the core set of tools um, in MET Plus is the, the MET Statistical Suite. 
Um, and those tools are designed to be like any other Linux type of um, uh, uh, tool where the focus is on a fairly small, narrow um, capability. And then the, the um, intention is that they should be strung together using scripting to actually complete your verification needs. Um, and so uh, over here in the, the um, left-hand side are the dark green bubbles. Those are our pre-processing or reformatting tools. In the middle are our statistical tools. And then over on the right in the yellow are our analysis tools. And um, you can see that we have lots of them um, and the data are passed from one tool to another using um, you know, the output, um, usually that CDF or, or ASCII. That plus itself, is that wrapper around all those tools. It replaces the need for you to do your own scripting. Um, it provides that low level workflow that's needed to pass the data from one tool to another. And then it also allows you to um, set it up either for um, running things retrospectively um, or if you're running things in real time to um, be able to, to set up a, a range of dates over which you wanna compute the, st um, the statistics and, and you know, uh, match up the fields. Um, define multiple fields, define multiple masks, um, specify file naming conventions so, you, so those date ranges can kind of just um, drop into the file naming convention, whether that's in the um, path or in the, the actual file names, and then all the other configuration options um, in the MetPlus tool. So we're, we're, um, we've got it wrapped to try and, and make it a, a lot easier to get up, um, set up and running and, and um, using on a large quantity of data rather than just one file at a time. So here's a very simple example of a, you know, a path through the, the MET um, framework. Um, you, you know, say for instance, you've run PCP combined, which we, we covered a couple of weeks ago on uh, December 14th, if I recall. Um, that has a net CDF output that is then passed into GridStat, which is used to compute statistics. Um, and then if you wanted to, you could um, use stat analysis or our um, database and display system um, to do the, the additional analysis. So just a really quick um, overview on GridStat. Um, this was one of the core tools that was developed initially. Um, it's you know, designed to just compare gridded forecast to gridded observations on that same grid. Um, so we, we, you do have to um, either do regridding outside of GridStat or um, we do have automated regridding um, in GridStat. I'll, I'll cover that in a, a little bit. Um, the goal is to um, accumulate match pairs over that defined area at a single point in time. And then once you have those match pairs over a single point in time, you can either compute statistics just for that time, or you can use the analysis tools that are provided to aggregate through, through time. Um, and then um, it is set up so that you can verify on one or more um, levels for one or more variables. Um, so it, it does have a lot of flexibility in it. Um, the verification methods that are available in GridStat include um, computation for continuous statistics for fields like temperature and pressure and so forth, um, single and multi-categorical statistics for fields that you would typically threshold, like precipitation or reflectivity, or um, you know, uh, uh, even like winds if you if you're looking at um, different levels of winds or or clouds or something like that. Um, it does compute partial sums and the, the core um, contingency table counts from the raw fields. We also have computation for um, uh, computing probabilistic forecasts. There are neighborhood verification methods, which is a little bit more advanced, um, but can provide a lot of information if you're comparing um, prediction on two different um, spatial scales. There is Fourier decomposition included um, if you're uh, doing uh, uh, computation for global um, uh, prediction. And then there is the ability to compute parametric or non-parametric confidence intervals for the st statistics over that defined area for that single point in time. Um, if, if you find that to be meaningful, it may not be as meaningful as if you um, compute it over the aggregate, aggregate through time, and we have the ability to compute those um, confidence intervals for that as well. The input into GridStat is um, either GRIB1, which is the older format of GRIB, GRIB2, which comes from the output from um, tools, at least um, within the NSEP suite, uh, like the unified post processor, or um, if your institution has other um, uh, post processing capability that writes a, a GRIB2 format, it should read that just fine. 
Um, and then NetCDF file formats, um, either coming from our MET tools, such as MET um, PCP Combine, or the WARF and CHIRP, um, which is um, something that comes out of the, the weather research and forecast model um, that is still being used um, pretty heavily within the US, and then um, CF compliant NetCDF. We also, um, you know, through Python and Benning, can take in gridded um, forecasts and observations or analyses files if they're gridded um, through a Python interface. Um, so that gives you a lot more flexibility to go beyond the GRIB1, GRIB2, and, and that CDF file formats. Um, and then we use the ASCII configuration file to pass in all of the um, options um, that uh, need to be uh, taken into account for GridStat to perform the um, the capability or to perform the statistics that it's going to compute. The output files um, are, uh, there is an ASCII.stat file that has all the, um, all the information for all the different types of um, statistics computations, which are called line types. Um, however, there is also the option to, to say, I want to, own, I want to have the statistics for um, the continuous line type, or continuous statistics, only in the um, you know in this .cnt .txt file or for categorical the cts .txt and so forth. So you can break that out if you don't want everything um, all together. And then there's the um, optional um, uh, ability to write to um, netcdf um, not only the match pair files uh, or match pair information, but also some additional um, gridded fields that go into the computation. I'll show that in a, in a little bit too. Here's the usage. Um, so uh, you, uh, like all of the MET tools, you would uh, call it by um, the tool name, but with an underscore, so grid underscore stat, all lowercase. Um, the forecast file, um, you pass that in, the obs file name, you pass that in. Both of those can have um, you know, the paths to the file in it. It, can, it doesn't have to just be the file name, um, as well as the con configuration file. Um, you can specify where the output is written. The output um, naming convention is fairly specific, but there is the ability to modify um, or append um, the naming convention to make things uh, more meaningful to um, what you're writing out. And then if you want to write out a log file, um, you can you know, specify where, where you want that to be written as well as the verbosity level. Um, you know, the, the larger the number for verbosity, the, the more information you get. Fairly, uh, a typical number would be um, two. So I'll show you that in a second. So here's what you would, um, what running uh, grid stack on the command line without MET plus just by itself for just one um, time would look like. You would um, point it to where the, the MET build um, is based, or if that's already in your um, profile, you can you know just type grid stat. It should be able to find it. Um, and then you pass in the forecast file name, the, the um, OBS file name or analysis name. Um, this is the configuration um, name that we have, which is uh, grid stack configuration for accumulated precip 24 hour accumulation. And then we, we just wanna write the data out to um, an out directory and verbosity level two. This is what it looks like when it runs. You can see that it's um, echoing uh, all the information that was in the command um, line so that you can confirm that it is really finding the files that you want it to find. Many times, um, you know, if you're seeing an error, it's possible that it's pulling the wrong file and, and um, you thought that it was reading one file but, um, or not another. Um, and then it tells you what it's actually doing as far as processing. Um, and then it tells you what output files it, it writes. And so you can see here, not only did it write a .stat file, but it also wrote um, specific files for all the different line types um, that are available, um, that were uh, requested um, in the configuration file, as well as a NetCDF file. Okay, so I had also mentioned that um, the, the um, fields need to be on the same grid. Um, and so many times you'll have, like this is, you know, a model forecast is on, um, you know, uh, one projection and um, your analysis is on a, a different one, could be latitude and longitude for one and, and you know, Lambert conformal for another or polar stereographic or whatever. You need to be able to get those um, to, to a point where, you know, all the latitudes and longitudes can be matched up. As I mentioned before, you can either use um, utilities in, in um, post-processing tools like the Unified Post Processor outside of MET, um, like CopyGB, um, 
or you can, which this is what how it re, it would result is it's over the um, western part of the U.S. and stage four also winds up being um, projected it that way. Um, however, you can also uh, do uh, regridding either in a in our re regrid data plane tool within the Met tool suite, and that's if you are um, you know, needing to, um, if you're going to be using the files routinely over and over again, say if you're running retrospective um, evaluations, um, you, you have that ability. But also you can um, do automated regridding within the tools um, themselves in GridStat as well as any other um, tools that handle a gridded um, forecast and, and OBS um, data. So once again, same projections. Um, this is what it looks like in the configuration file where you can tell it which grid you want it to um, to regrid to, whether it's to the forecast um, OBS or um, to a, a external um, a different definition uh, uh, grid, um, what method of interpolation you want to use, um, and if that uh, interpolation actually has um, a specific width, you can use that as well. Um, and then a uh, shape is either square or circle at this time. Um, so uh, basically, um, you can see how uh, if you were to say, please regrid everything um, to the forecast grid or to the OBS grid or to a, a, a separate grid as G130. Um, I saw someone uh, request uh, knowing if, if um, we can do regridding of tripolar. We are, um, we, right now we're handling tripolar in, using Python embedding. Um, and so uh, we, we have an example of how you can read in um, a tripolar grid and and um, pass it into the the grid set tools for uh, verification purposes. Um, that way, um, we don't necessarily have that support directly um, through um, through the the regrading capability because that's an unstructured grid that um, we we are working to support but are not quite ready to fully support. Okay, so we also have automatic regrading of maths. So, say for instance, you use the the grid um, the uh, Gen VX mask tool, and you generate a, a mask, but then all of a sudden, you, while you like your, your mask, you want to apply it to a new forecast that it has a different um, projection. Um, you can uh, ex uh, expect uh, MetPlus to be able to, to do that regrading for you. Say, for instance, um, you know you have it uh, originally on the projection of one, grid 104, which is a, an NCEP-defined grid, and you want to put it on grid two, um, 223. And, and so um, the, the masking will be um, regridded. Um, okay, so I, I showed you a little bit of what the configuration file might look like. Um, I, this is a, a more of the configuration file. Um, you can see, once again, it's in the ASCII format. And then we have um, these dictionaries, which are um, you know, uh, kind of enclosed by square brackets and then um, attributes associated with the dictionaries. Um, so in this case, uh, what we are doing is we're looking at accumulator precip, um, and uh, we're uh, comparing our forecast, which is in grid format, to our um, analysis or observation, which is in the NetCDF format. Um, you can tell the difference, um, not only by the, the naming convention, but um, the easier way is to just look at the level. If the level has, um, you know, uh, letters and, and numbers in it, it's likely a GRIB 1 or GRIB 2 format. Um, if it's got the um, parentheses with stars with an array and, you know, a sense of dimension, that's in that CDF file format. Um, we're also looking at, um, you know, thresholding with this cat thresh category um, for both um, all rain or, you know, some um, small to moderate rain. Um, we are saying that we want to accumulate statistics over all the points in the domain um, and, and not just the um, eastern, uh, as well as the eastern part of the U.S. Um, as per this polyline mask. Um, we also want to compute some neighborhood um, uh, statistics. Uh, and then we want to write out um, a fair amount of information. Um, so not only the continuous um, the continuous and categorical statistics, but also the neighborhood um, statistics that we're computing. Um, and then we also um, want to have um, all the information available to us at this point because we're you know, trying to understand what's going on with, um, uh, with our model. We want to be able to, to um, you know, look at um, some of the raw fields as well as the difference field. And then also, um, you know, if you wanted to look at um, what, what occurs when you apply the neighborhood method or 
um, or uh, decomposed using Fourier, Fourier methods and so forth. You, that um, information is in this net CDF pairs um, flag uh, request. Okay, going back to um, uh, just understanding the, the GRIB um, and NetCDF naming convention just a little bit more. Um, if you want to know what the GRIB abbreviations all stand for, um, here's a link to the table. We also have that available on the MET Plus um, website as well as the, the um, inner MET um, website. Um, levels, there are several different levels. Um, there's A, which stands for accumulation interval. So if your um, field can be accumulated, um, it would have A and then, um, you know, uh, possibly hour, hour, or hour, hour, minute, minute, or hour, hour, minute, minute, second, second. Um, P um, stands for pressure level. So if you're looking at things on a pressure level, you can either look at it at a specific pressure level or through a layer. Z um, refers to a vertical layer. So that's um, more typically for like winds and temperature and so forth. So Z2 is the two meter temperature. Z10 is the um, 10 meter winds. Z80 would be the 80 meter winds. Um, if there's a, a, um, a layer, you could also have a layer um, specified. L is a generic le um, layer level type. Um, typically this is uh, used with um, fields that are integrated throughout the, um, the vertical, um, uh, or if there's a specific um, level such as uh, the level 100, um, I, I, I can't really think of a, a field that would have that. But um, And then uh, if you want to, to pull out a specific record number from the GRIB, um, data. If you're really struggling with getting the the right um, the right uh, field, you could look in the the group data and and um, identify the the record layer and um, record number and pull out that record number. However, you have to be careful because um, group data is kind of written as it comes out of the model, and so um, that that record number could change for a particular um, field um, at for in each different file. So you can't always rely on uh, you know, 80 meter winds being um, R225. Uh, For NetCDF, um, it, the name is, is a string um, also. The level is considered to be a string. And you can see here that um, uh, basically um, we need uh, the information to index into the NetCDF file. So um, if, uh, for example, uh, precip at six, um, six hour uh, accumulations, all we have there is latitude and longitude to um, to look at, and and so um, you know you, it would be specified by uh, star comma star, um, and you would probably want the full field. Um, however, if you only want to you know look at a particular point in in um, in the uh, the field, you could specify you know a specific um, a latitude and longitude or, or you know the the um, the index into that. Um, you can also have um, uh, multi-dimensional up to four-dimensional easily um, a field where it's time, number of levels, um, and then the you know the in essence the latitude and longitude. Um, and so you can see here what we're trying to do is we're indexing through um, different levels, um, vertical levels um, through the model. Okay, um, for the output, I'm I'm going to just run through it really quickly. Um, uh, just just know that they're kind of grouped together. So um, uh, there's a list of the categorical um, statistics for both single threshold and multiple thresholds. Um, if you are looking at continuous statistics and, and you want to um, also look at the scalars, um, the partial sums, you can. Uh, those are uh, the two line types. Vect wind vector statistics um, are contained with a um, the line type starting with a V. Probabilistic, all of the probabilistic except for the economic cost loss value, all start with a P, and then the economic cost loss value is ECLV. Neighborhood methods all start with an N. Um, and then we have some other line types that are um, embedded in the computation of things like the S1 um, statistics, which is part of the CBS scores and WMO, uh, from WMO. Um, so the grad is, is part of the gradients that's computed for the, um, CB, uh, for the S1 score. We also have 22 um, common header columns, which are defined in the MET um, user's guide um, that have a lot of metadata that um, allows you to stratify um, your results, um, you know, uh, by thresholds or by, um, you know, what, uh, 
uh, region it is, um, you know, and, and so forth. So um, there's a lot of header information. And then after that, the lines vary based on what the um, statistic line type is. So um, just an example for uh, the config file that we had, um, we would have two lines in the .stat file, the one that has all of the different um, statistics in it. We'd have two lines for the continuous statistics. We'd have four lines for the categorical statistics and eight lines for the neighborhood statistics that we um, requested. So that's a total of 14 lines. Um, uh, we would, in the um, .cnt, um, uh, statistics um, the uh, it would there would be only two lines um, if you had a dot uh, say for instance dot cts um, dot text file there would be four and so forth and then we would have the netcdf um, containing the match pairs this is what the um, netcdf would look like um, you would have the the forecast full and the um, eastern uh, masking region you'd have the obs full and eastern masking region and you also have the difference. And um, the difference field can be really um, quite useful. Um, and you can then take that in a CDF and, and plot that and use that um, in your analysis. If, say, for instance, um, you, you don't necessarily want to um, you know, uh, carry forward um, the masking regions, um, because if you um, have you know, like lots of masking regions, it's writing out each one of those. That makes the NetCDF file format really large. You can, um, in the config file, say apply mask equal false, and then all it would do is it would just um, provide you with the full domain information, and then you can just kind of, you know, look at um, where the masking regions are. Um, you can compare different fields. Um, in this case, what we're doing is we're looking at integrated water vapor versus precipitable water. Um, many times the forecast is IWV, and, and the OBS are um, PWAT or precipitable water. Um, and they many times are scaled differently. And so this is an example of how you could handle two fields that are scaled differently. As long as it makes sense to you to make that comparison, um, you can go ahead and do this. Um, and so in this case, um, integrated water vapor is typically 10 times more than precipitable water. Um, and, and so this is how you would handle the, um, the thresholding. I'm not gonna really go into detail on some of these other um, uh, uh, slides that I have other than to show you um, that we do have the ability to do data smoothing. That is a, a different way of kind of taking into account, um, you know, neighborhoods of, of um, uh, data and so forth. So if this is the two meter temperature. Hi, all. This is John. Um, Tara, I want to let you know that he, uh, we can't hear you. Looks like she's gone, John. Maybe she's trying to reconnect. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. Tara, you're muted. Ah, thank you, Ben. Um, so now I know that you can at least see me, and now you can hopefully hear me. And let me go back to um, sharing my screen. And my apologies, I do not know what happened. OK, 
Can people see my screen? Yes. Yep. yes. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Sorry. Um, so I was talking about um, neighborhood methods and how, um, you know, if, if we were to threshold these neighborhood methods, um, uh, what you would wind up uh, at greater than zero, you would wind up with four of the, the boxes, um, you know, uh, exceeding that. And then if you were to look in um, different neighborhoods, you would be able to compute different um, uh, scores for that. Um, and if you're if uh, in a grid stat sense, you would be computing things like fraction skill score and fraction prior score. If you're doing this um, in a grid to point method, which we'll talk about um, you know later on, then you would be um, computing um, something like a, a HIRA score. Um, and then or, uh, you'd be using the HIRA method and computing Briar skill score, Briar score, excuse me. Um, and I need to go into presentation mode, sorry. There we go, and swap. Oh, swap. Okay. So just here's some examples of, of what the different, what the neighborhoods look like um, in, in essence in the forecast and observed fields. And these um, methods are for um, uh, widths from three to 19. And what you're seeing over here, especially on the, um, the observation um, side of things is that um, the edge effects really um, uh, increases as you increase in, in neighborhood sizes. So you may wanna keep that in mind when you're looking at these larger and larger um, neighborhoods. Um, also want to point out, once again, I mentioned Fourier decomposition. This is what it looks like. This is what the configuration um, could look like. Um, and in essence, you can um, not only look at the full field, but you can group um, wave numbers. Um, so this is the zero to three, four to nine, and 10 to 20. Uh, this was originally um, instigated uh, for the the EMC global verification um, capability, but I think it's um, quite useful um, if you're looking at global verification in general. Also, speaking of global verification, um, uh, we do have grid box weighting if you need that um, for like the computation of anomaly correlation or something like that. So if you have it set to none, um, there would be no um, you know weighting at all. If you have it set to cosine latitude, that um, basically um, computes the weight of the cosine at, um, of the uh, grid point latitude. And so you can see that, um, you know, the, the weights are um, higher. Uh, I can't read them right now. Um, the, the, the weights are, are higher, um, lower, and, and, uh, and as you get to the pole, a little bit less um, weighted. And then um, uh, area is also very similar, except for it's looking at the true area of the grid box. Once again, um, I think we'll wind up going into this um, in the future. I just wanted to, to demonstrate that we do have that capability. We also have the ability to convert data. Say, for instance, your uh, forecast fields come out in terms of um, Kelvin, and you want to be um, presenting results in terms of Celsius or even Fahrenheit. Um, we do have that, the ability to, um, to do that in the config files, um, and here's just some examples of convert. If you want more information, um, or if, if you decide that this is something that you want to spend some more time on in a later session, um, more information can be obtained within the, the MET user's guide, and then we can also consider um, talking more about it in a, in a further um, presentation. Censoring data is also something that um, you may want to do. You may want to do that if you know that there are, um, you know, that there's um, un un um, reliability in certain values, um, especially in your observations, um, or if you want to um, conditionally um, compute uh, actually um, uh, continuous statistics, but say, for instance, only for a particular um, range of data. Um, and uh, say, or, you know, for example, for reflectivity, if you only want to look at what um, is occurring in, in more um, severe storms with uh, uh, reflectivity greater than 35 dBZ, you could, um, you know, censor things and, and tell, tell um, Gristat to set everything um, below 35 dBZ to a, a sensor value of zero. Um, here's another example. If you have a two meter temperature field and say, for instance, you wanted to basically only look at, um, you know, what was uh, um, uh, greater than 280 degrees Kelvin. Maybe you're not um, particularly uh, comfortable with um, how well your, your temperature sensor 
does near zero and below. Um, then you could um, set sensor thresh um, to 280, less than 280, um, and then your sensor value would be negative 999, which is the um, basically the bad data value for um, MET tools. And, and so the, the valid data that would be used for the evaluation is shown here in the color, and everything else would be considered bad data. It, um, censoring data can be a really powerful way to stratify your data um, for uh, evaluation purposes. Okay, um, also wanted to point out that we do have climatology data um, as support for climatology for computing anomaly correlation. Once again, this is, I think, something we're going to go into in more depth, but here's um, basically how you would set up the, the climatology. We also have the support for binned climatologies um, if your institution uses that for computing um, statistics, especially for um, ensemble um, uh, prediction. Okay, so um, at this point, I want to give um, Tina at least 20 minutes to, um, to go ahead and, and do hands-on. Uh, I do want to point out, though, at the end of this presentation to kind of support what she's doing, we do have some very basic information about the use cases, um, you know, where you can find them um, in the user guide. Um, you know, we have them stratified by MET tools as well as model applications. If you're just looking at um, getting started with the basics, I'd suggest working with the MET tools. Um, you know, here's like a basic use case, and then here's um, a little bit more, um, uh, 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 a little bit more complicated use case. I'm just looking at anomaly correlation um, com using climatologies. Um, this is what the MET plus configuration files look like. You've already kind of seen that. You're going to see it in the hands-on. So here's just some examples of um, uh, what the timing information um, works out to be. Once again, um, we're going to go into a lot of depth of this. Um, next week, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, just letting you know that it's here so you can think about it, so you can come into the meeting next week um, prepared with questions. Um, and then this is how you would specify, you know, different um, variables, um, fields, how you'd apply many of the, the um, options that we just discussed um, in this very quick presentation, and then how that relates back into the MET config file. Once again, George is going to go into this a lot next week. I just wanted to provide you with a little bit of a view into it, um, as well as um, the file name templates. Um, so we do have support for, um, you know, uh, having file names that have leads or valid times or dates or regions or, you know, all that kind of stuff. Once again, more information next week. So at this point, I'm going to hand it off to, um, to uh, Tina, but I do want to also assign homework. While we're going to go through the MET Plus use case today, I would um, suggest that you go back um, over the, the course of this week and also just go through the MET tool um, online tutorial, learning how to run the, the tools themselves. So you can appreciate it a little bit more um, and appreciate how much easier it is with MET Plus to run um, you know, these examples. So um, with that, are there any like immediate questions that um, those that are watching feel that I should answer or should we just jump right over to Tina? Okay, then Tina, why don't you take it away? I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, thanks. Um, I just put a link to the hands-on in the chat if anybody would like to see that. Let me... Try and share my screen. Um, all right, so it looks like that's up. So as Tara mentioned, we're just going to go through how to run a GridStat use case using NetPlus. Um, so you will want to be logged into whatever machine you're on. And if you've not sourced your tutorial setup, let me get into this. If you've not sourced your NetPlus tutorial setup script, you'll need to do that before running this example. So with that, I'm just going to go ahead and dive right in. Um, if I'm going too fast, uh, somebody, uh, you know, feel free to cut in and tell me to slow down. I can't see the chat when I'm working in another window. So um, putting it in there won't do a lot of good. So um, first thing you want to do is obviously be in your MET Plus tutorial. Dir. And before we run this, um, we're going to go ahead and um, take a look at the configuration file for what we're running. Whoops. So I'm going to take a look at 
configuration file. I'm just going to copy paste this in the tutorial. So met plus build base, parm, use cases, met tool wrapper, um, grid stack, grid stack.com. So I'm going to take a look at that. Um, and so in this case, you can see that we're running grid stat is the only one listed in the process list and we're running by initialization time. So in this case, it's one initialization time because the start and the end are the same. Although if we were looping between them, it would be a 12 hour increment. And so if I continue and go down and look at some of the other settings, probably the more important one down here are the forecast and observation variables that we're using. So forecast bear one name, um, and very one level, this is um, ABCP is precipitation. And in this case, the level specified by accumulation. So AO3 um, is three hour accumulation. And then these are the thresholds that we're using um, to compute statistics. And then our observations are a similar name, um, but in this case, ABCP03, and this is a NetCDF file. So you can see the star star for the levels and we're using the same uh, thresholds for uh, the observations. So, um, and then, so we'll go down a little bit further um, and take a quick look at the uh, file name templates. So uh, there's the name of our uh, grid stat forecast and observation uh, templates, uh, timing templates that we're using. So with that, um, I will go ahead and we're going to go ahead and try to run the use case. And so to do this, we call the run metplus.py and then we give it um, the configuration files. So the first one is this configuration file that we just took a look at. And then the second one is my tutorial conf which contains some path in it um, configuration file and then um, lastly oh I apologize um, the phone I'm in a different location today and the phone at my parents house is ringing um, so um, and then finally this config dot output base is a way to modify a configuration in uh, the output file um, on the command line. So you can change the output base on the command line. So I'm just going to go ahead and try to run this. And um, you can see in this case that it finished successfully um, because it says Metplus has successfully finished running. So we can review the output files and see what it's produced by going to this output directory that we just took a look at. Met plus tutorial, dir, output, grid stat, met tool wrapper, um, grid stat, and then the date directory. So let's see what's in there. So in this case, you can see there's two files, um, the, the gradient and ECLV, and then a stat file, which, um, may contain, which probably contains all of these. Um, so economic cost loss value and the gradient lines were written to separate text files and um, that because that's the way we have it set but if i take a look at this one it will have both of the data um, it should have the economic cost loss and and also um, contingency table counts and statistics which we wrote out to the stat file but which we didn't give separate stat lines for. Um, so we can also, for this case, take a look at the log output. So um, I'm going to have a couple of log files in here from the last time I ran it. So in this case, it'll be the one. It'll, it should be the most recent one, the 104. Um, oops. Want this ls in this case it'll be the most recent one the most recently dated that i just took a look at 
um, and we can scroll through this file and see the command that it ran. So this would be the, what the met command would look like on the command line. Um, and then at the bottom that it was successfully finished running. So the final configuration file is called uh, metplusfinal.conf. And so if we take a look at that, we can, this is when you're using multiple configuration files, if, if there's any question which configuration was used, this is a way to take a look at that. And so it shows all of the MET plus configurations, our initialization times and ends, um, our grid stat parameters that are down in through here. And then also um, our output and input and output directories. So uh, that's if there's any question or anything that didn't work, then that's where you go to take a look at that. So that was the first exercise. So we're going to go ahead and go through um, to additional exercises. And if you're following along with the, uh, the web page, there's um, three exercises at the top that um, I'm not sure we'll get to all of them, but um, if we don't, there are also good things to try in addition to just running uh, grid, the grid stat use, uh, running grid stat by itself. So um, previously we ran a, what, what's called a MET tool wrapper use case, but there's additional um, use cases that we have available in the model applications uh, section. So we can try running one of these and so I'm going to do ls net plus build base. And then let me see where this is located. Net plus build base, harm, use cases, um, model application. So I can take a look at what's in here. And these are all the different air quality, climate, convection allowing models. These are all different uh, use cases that we have available uh, to run. So um, let's see, um, I apologize, I lost my, okay. So let's take a look at one of the use in, uh oh, there we go, okay, I was freezing for a minute. Let's take a look at one of the use cases in the medium range, um, grid stat, forecast GFS, OBS GFS, um, Looks like that to climo ends up multifield.com and try and see if we can run this one and I'm not at the top. So in this case, we're running um, by valid time as opposed to the previous case where we were looping over initialization time and there's two processes in the process list, grid stat and stat analysis um, and two lead times, 24 and 48 hours. And so here, rather than the one variable that we had, which was precipitation, we have temperature, um, UV, and pressure. And we have three levels for temperature, U and V. Um, pressure levels 850, 500, and 250. And then mean sea level pressure, um, which just at, um, uh, this obviously just at mean sea level pressure. Um, and so in this case, um, we're using um, scalar partial sums is one of the lines that we're outputting. Um, so we can go ahead and try to run this use case again using our run met plus whoops, dot pi and then giving it this file that I just used. And then my tutorial configuration file, which contains the, those input and output bases and paths that we'll need for it. And then here again, I'm going to go ahead and override my output directory on the command line. So if I don't do it on the command line, I'll get whatever is in the um, whatever is in the configuration file. And I'm going to go ahead and hit enter and try to run this. And this will take a little bit longer because it's processing more variables and more lead times than what we were processing in the previous step. So I'm going to give it a little bit more time to run. Okay. 
And then when it finishes, we can take a look at the output, which is in the output base that we overrode. So here we're running the second lead time. And again, info met plus has successfully finished running. So I want to um, inspect the output that's in this uh, met plus tutorial dir output grid stack climo. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, cut and paste that met plus tutorial dir output grid stack climo and see what's there. Um, and you can see the metplusfinal.conf is in that directory, but then there should also be um, data in the met out EFS directory. Oops. Um, I need to give it more zeros. Okay. One more grid stack. So you can see in this case, we got two stat files, which are the only things that we have turned on. And if I want to take a look at one of these stat files, I can just copy, take a look at it here. And so lots of lines for all the different variables. Um, and um, for the different, if I continue to scroll over, I should be able to see um, the different line types, scalar partial sums in here, and uh, some vector partials, partials on the line. So uh, next exercise would be to try to add another variable to this grid stat directory and see if we can get that working. So the first thing I'm going to do is copy this to my user config area so that I'm not potentially uh, editing the one, you know, if I mess something up. I'm not potentially editing the one that's previously working. So I'm going to copy this Climo multi field to my user config area, which is in this current directory user config right here. And I'm going to call it gridstatadrh.conf. So then once I do that, I can user config gridstat at our h.conf. Now here I've got four variables and so to add our h I'm going to give it another uh, another variable. Um, oh in this case we're using both so in the very first configuration file we had a specific obs and forecast variable names because they were different but in this case they're the same so we're using both. Um, so I'm going to call it RH, and then I'm going to give it a both there five levels. Let's, let's see. It's add RH at pressure levels 500. So I need P500 and P250 to the output. And so that should be all that I have to do to get it in here. Um, let me give me one second here. So now I'm just going to run this new one. And the script is in my user config gridstatadrh.conf. And then I've also got to give it the path to my tutorial directory again and then i will overwrite the output directory so that it goes to um, output exercises at our age so i'm not in the same directory as before and so we're gonna hit that enter and run it and like before, it's going to take a few seconds for it to run through all of this. And then we'll check the log and make sure. That it comes through, so giving it a little bit more time to go through all of these variables, but we can see that the RH here printing out. Um, 
that I looks like I might have made an error because it's calling the level Z zero, which is not what I want it to do. Um, so let me see what I did. Should have. A, um, a user in the chat pointed out that both var oh, five name. Yeah. yeah okay. Okay, so uh, sorry for that. I typoed here. Um, that's what happens when you go back. Okay, so we're gonna try. We're gonna try running this again and see if we can actually get it to do. <laughs> Now we have RH here with the correct levels. So thanks to whoever caught that. Um, I'm still I'm still getting back <laughs> into the swing of things um, after the holidays. So once this finishes, we'll take a look at the log output in this direct in the directory where it gets sent to. And we can also check in the log output and make sure that our so our log output is going to met plus tutorial dir output exercises at our age. Um, I ran it twice since the first time was an error. So I'm gonna view the second log file since the first one was incorrect. Um, and I should see that it processed. If I go down here, there's temperature, the different fields, U and V. Um, uh, mean sea level pressure. And then finally, here it is. RH at 500 and RH at 250 is computed. Um, I don't know if I've got time to go through boosting the log setting. Um, I think we'll go ahead and just stop here for the day and you can try exercise one, three on your own, which is changing the log settings, but that'll give time if anyone has any questions on what we did. Um, I could take questions or um, if, if anyone's got questions on Tara's part. Uh, so, Philip. Yeah, so I ran this example adding the relative humidity, and I see RH in the log file, but I look at that grid stat um, file that has, that has, you know, the text file. I don't see it. It's identical to the original case, so it's there's no forecast statistic for RH. Um, you looked at the stat output file? So in the the, it's the met out GFS anom you know, valid date file, and it's identical to the original, even though I see RH being processed in the log file. So it's in add RH, met out, GFS, and no. Yeah. Uh -huh. Let's see. Let's just pick one of Whoops. Function home. It doesn't do this to me. Okay, I apologize. Let me open this up. Oh, it should be all the way. Oh, you're right. It didn't end up in there. Um. We may need to take a look at that because I'm not clear off off the top of my head what happened. Right. Hey, Tina, this is this is John. Um, yeah, I think it's a great. So this is a great thing to point out. Like, what, what do you do when you don't see get what you expected? So we ran it through Met Plus. Um, we look in the output. We don't see the output we expected. So I would I would take a look at the log file um, and. You pointed out that um, it's, we see RH being processed, but we should. And the log messages can indicate, um, you know, how many match pairs are processed for each masking region. Um, so let's see what we find here. So 
it says it's compute, it's processing RHP250. And there are matched pairs in here. Okay. Computing scalar partial sums and partial statistics. I see them in here. Um, you could try just copying and pasting the path from the this log file to look at the output. In case it went somewhere I didn't expect. Oops. Let's take a look at this. Hmm. Yeah, this is a this is a little bit perplexing. Um and we didn't notice this the first time around. So this might be something that we need to take a closer look at and make sure. Um, make sure, because it's not, it's not clear off that. So thanks for pointing this out, uh, Philip. Um, it's not clear to me uh, what exactly went awry. Um, but I think I personally would have to take a deeper look to answer your question and maybe we can um, have it, you know, maybe we can have a cookie answer or post a fix somewhere on the website when, when we get it up. All right, thanks. Okay, yeah. Um, are there any other questions? All right, so I mean, if there's no other questions, then I think we can wrap up for the day and just um, we'll make a note to to um, figure out what went what went awry with the uh, with the relative humidity. That sounds good. Um, and next week uh, we're going to be just pretty much going over MetPlus configuration and taking a look at the MetPlus example wrapper and and spending a real uh, a long time on the configuration. So now that you've been introduced to MetPlus, I'm sure there's lots of questions and, and we're gonna try and address um, as many as we can next week. So looking forward to seeing you next week. Thanks everybody.